Welcome to Spybrary. By spy fans, for spy fans. With Shane Whaley. Shane dives into the mystery and intrigue of spy books and movies. Both fact and fiction. Delivering reviews and interviews with authors, historians, intelligence experts, and spy fans. He discusses everything from John Le Carre, Len Dayton, Ian Fleming, Tom Clancy, Brad Thor, and many more. If you love spy books and movies, keep listening. This podcast is for you. This is Spyberry. It's a brush pass, quick and simple. You are listening to Brush Pass on Spyberry. Quick reviews sent in by spy fans for spy fans. John Nordeen, and I'm offering a brush pass review of a novel by R. Wright Campbell that was first published in 1975, The Spy Who Sat and Waited. Now, you hear that title, and you'd think that this is a comedy, and perhaps Johnny English will show up, or maybe an American politician. Nothing could be farther from the truth. This is a very serious story. It's not a shoot 'em up, but one that leads you to think about decisions you made and decisions you didn't make or were made for you. Our protagonist is William Orter, and we find him at the end of World War I as a clerk in the Dortmund Trading Company in Bern, Switzerland. He's been involved in some minor intelligence work for Germany that has kept him out of the army and kept him safe in Switzerland. But now Germany's agents have been directed to go underground. And in April 1919, at an awkward meeting with his control, Orter is handed a new identity and a new place to live. He's to go to Zurich, establish himself as a Swiss national, and then to move on to the Orkneys in the north of Scotland. And so, as William Hartz, he eventually pitches up in Kirkwall in the Orkneys as a man looking for a business to buy. Soon, on his explorations, he finds a small tavern, the Sailing Master, for sale in Stormness, a tiny village on the shore of Scapa Flow the natural harbor that serves as a safe haven for the British fleet. And that's his mission, to watch and report the goings-on around Scapa Flow. But initially, there's nothing to report. And so he settles into a small, closed, and very reserved community. Wilhelm holds himself apart, not volunteering much about his made-up past, not gossiping, not asking questions. Ironically, that tends to suit the taciturn locals and eases his integration into village life. Running a tavern also helps. After he closes for the night, he often walks down to the harbor and smokes a pipe while looking at the ocean. It's there that a local, John Kendrick, befriends him, and that produces the first bit of tension, as Wilhelm doesn't want involvement, doesn't want friends, and so he keeps refusing John's invitation to dinner. Now, long about this point, I expected the chapter to end and the next one to begin 20 years later, and we'd get on with the bang-bang, if not the kiss-kiss. But Campbell doesn't do that. Instead, we readers are slowly drawn into the hidden complexities of life in a tiny Scottish village and the conflict that can develop around a tavern and drinking. At first, I was a bit impatient with this. Hey, let's get on with the spying. Then when Kendrick's spinster sister Molly came into the picture and the entire village took it as settled that Wilhelm would marry her because she'd make a good wife, I thought his legend might be exposed, but he refused to get involved with her and it wasn't. Then when he had his occasional encounters with his controls, each more awkward and incompetent than the last, I thought maybe this was the start of the spy business, but it wasn't. Eventually, I realized that Campbell wanted us to feel as settled and comfortable as Wilhelm did, and to feel that any return of the spying world would be an unwelcome intrusion into a settled life. Campbell tells this part of the story with great skill. The local color is convincing, the nature of the petty conflicts entirely realistic. The whole drama around Molly, who clearly would welcome an approach by Wilhelm, is a good example of Campbell's skill. 
In many novels, Molly would seem annoying, clearly portrayed as pathetic, and the firm rejection of a relationship would be the last we'd hear of the episode. But Campbell makes you hope Wilhelm will get involved and settle even more firmly down into the simple, enduring pleasures of a good family life. And when Molly's hope is rejected, she doesn't disappear, and the awkwardness of them continuing to bump into each other is briefly and painfully made clear. Slowly, the title of the novel comes to make more and more sense. Wilhelm doesn't act as much as he is acted upon. He accepted his undercover mission as much because, as he puts it, I haven't any particularly valuable skills or any grand designs for my life. And would his mission be important? How would I know, his control replied. This might make our protagonist seem irritating and the story boring, but that's not the case. He's a good active manager of his tavern. He solves the little problems that come his way. His one impulsive act is to get involved with a woman much less suitable than Molly, but one who is in a lot of trouble, and so he helps her. In fact, his generally quiet, peaceful life seems rather attractive. I like the chance to watch the sun go down on the ocean while smoking a pipe. Sounds like a good way to end the day. I actually found I wanted the spy business to go away altogether and just find out what the years would bring Wilhelm, the tavern owner. But as the years advance, Germany comes back to power and aggression, and that makes Wilhelm's quiet life slowly become untenable. Everyone accepted him as a Swiss rather than a German initially. That solved the problem for the villagers that having their low-key tavern owner be a hated German would have created for them. But as the 30s advance, the village's patriotism stirs, and they are less inclined to see a difference between a Swiss and a German. And now his control reappears and is much less bumbling and much more demanding than before. Those of you who know your World War II history will recall an event at Scapa Flow in 1939. All I'll say is that it turns out our tavern keeper had a role in that. One of the blurbs on the cover of my copy of the book says, A novel of blistering insight and endless intrigue. Eh, no. More like a slow simmer than any blistering. But if any of you have ever wondered at decisions you made in life and other paths you might have gone down, and especially those times when you did not make a decision, but that turned out to be a decision. This novel will make you think about those implied choices, the times when you sat and waited, the times when the decisions of others wouldn't leave you alone. There's more to the plot than this, and some actual spying and actual violence, but I don't want to spoil the drama for you by revealing more. Campbell, who lived from 1927 to the year 2000, was a Hollywood screenwriter for movies and television. He wrote somewhere between 21 and 27 novels, depending on which website you believe. The Spy Who Sat and Waited was his debut novel. I think this was the only spy novel in the bunch. He's much better known for a series of mystery novels, especially those set in Los Angeles. This is a very well-written book, closely observed compelling, and much different than many of our run-of-the-mill spy shoot 'em ups The Spy Who Sat and Waited by R. Wright Campbell. I think you'll enjoy it. Can you pull off a brush pass? Send in your review to shane at spybrary.com. For listening to the Spybrary podcast. You don't have to wait for the next episode. Join the conversation happening now at facebook.com/spybrary and on Twitter at spybrary. <laughs>